Hello, and welcome to our Signal Media webinar series. I'm George Seifers with Signal Magazine, and our topic today is preparing for transformational changes to video distribution systems to meet the objectives of the Cyber Executive Order. I will be speaking with Scott Barella, Chief Technology Officer at PESA, and with Dennis Defenser, PESA's Vice President, as well as Federal and SLED Policy Expert. When our experts are finished presenting, we will hold a Q&A for as long as time allows or until we run out of questions. So throughout the webinar, attendees are welcome to submit questions electronically through the Ask a Question box on the webinar console. And with that, it is time to get started. Dennis, over to you. Thank you, George. So this is Dennis Defenser. Let me start with a few simple statistics. The percent of organizations affected by a successful cyber attack, according to a survey by CyberEdge, is 86.2%. The ratio of Americans victimized by ransomware is one in five. The number of DDoS attacks in 2020 is 4.8 million. That is 26,000 DDoS attacks per day. The average cost of US data breach is $8.6 million. The percent of cloud infrastructures, large and small, breached in 2020 is 70%. The increase in identity theft during the pandemic is 100%. The increase in industrial control systems being attacked in 2020, this is the, uh, the OT operational technology side, is 300%. The increase in malware in 2020 is 358%. And the increase in attacks against next generation supply chain systems is 420%. According to Chairman Jerome Powell of the Federal Reserve, the biggest threat to the world economy is not the pandemic, it's not inflation, it is cybersecurity. He gave us a dire warning about the risk of a market collapse similar in magnitude to the global financial crisis. Two months ago, President Biden signed a very comprehensive and a landmark cybersecurity executive order. The policy statement said, Cyber incidents is a top priority and essential, essential to national and economic security of the United States. Essential to the national security of the United States. This order has nine major sections. For the purposes of this webinar, we will focus on section three, which is modernizing federal government cybersecurity. Now, in the parlance of Washington, D.C., this executive order has real teeth. First, the overall responsibility of reviewing and revising the Federal Acquisitions regula Regulations, FAR and DFAR, falls on the shoulders of the Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Now, when the President of the United States ties the OMB to a major executive order that tells you the priority. It tells you funding is guaranteed. On top of that, it requires the director of OMB to consult with the five most powerful government officials, the Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Director of NSA, and the Administrator of General Services. GSA. It also appoints the responsibility 
of investigation to a powerful triangle of agencies. CISA, the highest agency responsible for cybersecurity, the FBI, in charge of all domestic affairs, the intel community in charge of international affairs, and finally, and most important, it holds all, not some, not a few, all the heads of all federal government agencies responsible for meeting the order. That includes, with 60 and 90 day milestones, adopting security best practices, advancing towards zero trust architecture, accelerating movement to a secure cloud service, FedRAMP, and within 180 days, all agencies, all agencies must adopt multi-factor authentication and encrypt for data at rest and encrypt for data in transit. This order is very specific as to who is accountable and it's very specific to the deadlines by number of days. This executive order will have a significant impact on the video distribution systems in the entire federal government. We now live in a world of ubiquitous video, but we also now live in a world of deep fake video audio technology, where we can no longer trust our own eyes and ears. VDS cybersecurity needs to provide video data integrity, where, wherever video data is critical data, and that includes command and control centers, strategic briefing rooms, tactical operations centers, nationwide broadcasters, law enforcement in local, state, and federal agencies, corporate crisis centers, the list goes on. This order will not tolerate incremental changes. It highlights and it calls for bold changes and significant investments to secure the government's computer systems on premises, on the cloud, and on the hybrid cloud. So when VDS is finally merging with IP because of the theoretically unlimited scalability and distance, with secure video over IP, the reality of a distributed command and control materializes. A distributed command and control is when the participants are no longer constrained to one room or one campus. They can be anywhere in the world. This was a crucial technology that was needed by the country during COVID because several C2s could not convene because a few members had COVID. And this combination absolutely requires cybersecurity dead center. You cannot have this combination without cybersecurity. So let me conclude with these few points. All current video distribution systems, which are not encrypted at rest and in transit, which are unable to function in a zero trust environment, which are weak in multi-factor authentication because there's no mutual authentication. It's not architected for a secure cloud. All these systems are in violation of the cybersecurity order. They are now legacy systems because they could become obsolete in 180 days. The challenges and opportunities are tremendous. One vital statistic, the projection for global cost of cybercrime in 2025, the global cost of cybercrime in 2025 is $10.5 trillion annually, annually. Let's put that in another context. $10.5 trillion is almost double the entire federal budget 
of the United States of America in 2022, double the entire budget of the entire country. One last statistic that's harder to quantify, the most advanced combat aircraft of the United States, the F-35 Lightning, also used by our allies, is more likely to be downed by a cyber attack than a missile attack. So I'll turn you over to Scott Barella. Scott Barella is one of the people I highly respect in the field of video distribution systems and cybersecurity. Over to you, Scott. Thanks, Dennis. <clears throat> and thanks for uh, participation in the event this afternoon, this morning, wherever you might be. Um, it's a great honor to speak to you today. I know your time's valuable. So we'll move into the, the technical parts of this so that uh, you get a better appreciation for what Dennis had, uh, had uh, highlighted there in the executive order and the, and the enormous task we have before us. So video distribution starts you know, with baseband signals. And what I mean by baseband is we typically use HDMI or DVI computer video, or in some cases we use a serial digital interface, the SDI format. And what this uh, entails is a defined silicon matrix such that you have a number of sources uh, to the left of the screen you see. Uh, those might be uh, cameras, they might be microphones, they might be all sorts of different source uh, uh, media pieces, whether it be audio, video, or even USB. And on the right-hand side of this matrix, you see a number of destinations, devices that you need to actually see the video, hear the audio, and connect the USB device proper. So you have a very fixed uh, matrix such that you have a number of defined inputs and a number of defined outputs. This is the way this has worked for the last 60, 70 years. Um, no, I'm not that old, and no, I did not see black and white, so <laughs> I do remember it as a kid, but that's about it. Um, the point here is that uh, it has a very limited uh, frame capacity, uh, so that when I run out of inputs, I have to select a larger frame capacity to accommodate those additional input signals and output signals. So. Um, from almost uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago even, uh, we started to look at uh, other ways of doing this. But we had confinements within the, the working structure of these current video distribution systems. The biggest uh, hurdle here is that the baseband signal was really never intended to be secure. Um, in fact, it was quite the opposite. You know, the charge was many decades ago to make sure that the signal can be plugged in no matter what to any monitor at any place at any time. Uh, so if you had an HDMI signal and you needed to hook it to a monitor or you had a BNC connector and you needed to hook it to a monitor, you simply connected the two to the monitor and away you go. Um, this was the intent from almost the very beginning. Um, obviously, when it comes to security, that tends to be an issue. So um, we constructed highways, gateways to um, make sure that they were open and free. So they were transparent. Um, they were open. This is kind of the way it all started, right? The idea was interoperability. Um, in no way can you take this kind of a signal and separate them out in terms of independent levels of security. In other words, have certain video signals for unclassified use, other signals for classified use, and maybe other signals for secret use. So there's a limitation of scale as well, as I earlier uh, uh, alluded to. Um, with IP, we tend to get out of this idea, but we do have a limitation of scale using these kinds of baseband signals in the kinds of matrix routers that we were confined to use. So this is kind of a, uh, an issue with how we would do security on baseband. So in essence, the signals are always there. Uh, I show them kind of spilling out of the cables here, um, whether it be HDMI or whether they be BNC or whether they be Ethernet. The point is you can take these signals, plug them into their intended device, and they will work. They will function. Um, in some ways, that's good, and in other ways, that's not good because we really don't have a handle 
on uh, who sees that, right? We certainly won't allow certain uh, objects in the USB field, such as uh, USB thumb drives. Um, but the point is, and when it comes to the audio and video elements, we can't really be assured unless we have physical security of these people being in or out. So the basic problem to begin with is the signal proper. The signal is not secured so that I can present that to the right people. So we do have an intrinsic problem with baseband. Uh, the other problem we have when we start to traverse this is we have the ability to change or alter the video content. Um, if the signal is interrupted and if the receiver can receive openly any signal it is, is given, then the idea of taking an image that has, for example, in my left hand little pip, a three, a three airplane uh, with one circled, and then I alter that to show only two planes, that could be disastrous. Um, so we want to get away from being able to alter the video. And so it's important that we start to look at ways to secure the actual video signal, the audio signal, the USB signal. These are all the intended pieces so that if we have some means and we move this to say IP, then we have somewhat of a shot at this. So the solution there is to provide an IP uh, topology where we, we, we can take the standard uh, SDI or HDMI or display port or USB or KVM in that fashion um, and encrypt them and encapsulate them and move them along as packets in a network. Uh, this uh, seems to be the, the, the easiest and most efficient way to secure signals in an IP domain. Here, we can take the uh, video, encrypt it, take the audio, encrypt it, and we can take the USB and encrypt it, move that to the places they're supposed to go and connect them as they're supposed to, and away we go. So this seems to be a very logical path in terms of the solution for these open-ended signals. So we advance all the way to 2021, and here we are faced with trying to get to zero trust architectures. We're trying to secure the signals proper, and we're wondering, well, gee, how should we go about this? Well, there's actually some wonderful guidelines already in place. They're handled under the National uh, Institute for Standard and Technology, otherwise known as NIST. They have a suite of standards, uh, a number of them, but one of them in particular for these media types might be encased underneath FIPS 140-2. This is the means to connect and control in an environment for either the Department of Defense or intelligence agencies or whatnot. The ability to encrypt the control essence pieces so that if I'm talking IP to a device, I need some means to encrypt it and some means to decrypt it with and I need a set of standards that is adopted for this kind of use. So we, we naturally looked at FIPS 140-2 encryption. In there, uh, we note that all Department of Defense's information network for their approved products list mandate that all IP communications use FIPS 140-2. Now, we are in a particular transition going from 140-2 to 140-3. There's very little difference at this juncture in time. But for the moment, uh, this is our year uh, grace of transition. So they are both allowed. Uh, both 140-2 uh, uh, started in the September of last year and will end in September of this year. And 140-3 will begin in September of this year and continue uh, forward. Um, here we, is where we find encryption standards. We have uh, a number of crypto pieces that can be used and they're all kind of signed off by NIST with a FIPS 140-2 designation. Now, it's important to note that it is not the certificates, the private keys, the public keys, the tokens, all the things that you need to uh, basically implement this encryption. That falls under the guise of uh, the um, Sweet B crypto. Now, the, the Sweet B cryptography is now known as the CNSA, uh, this has been kind of updated a little bit. Um, they now uh, do not allow 128-bit encryption for AES. They only will accept 256. This is a natural progression. Um, the e elliptical curve is used in Diffie-Hellman exchange of keys, and now they're looking for e ECDSA's 384. They used to have 256s. 
Um, the Shaws have been affected, but these are all the kinds of keys that are allowed and to be integrated to unlock the crypto I just mentioned in the FIPS 140-2. So the two go hand in hand. So the way to think about this is that you have a certain kind of mathematical formula here, an equation for cybersecurity, if you will. The first element in the equation is a, is a crypto module of, of, of the standard that, that NIST has approved. They are listed under the NIST guidelines, and they are all um, shown to users to see which modules can, in fact, be used. So that's the crypto part. Now we need the other part of that equation, and we need the actual Sweet B Crypto or the CNSA. Uh, this piece is how we're going to manage that encryption. Who will get the key to unlock it? How will they unlock it? All that equals the implementation of how I put together both the encryption and the keys to unlock that encryption. And that leads to a very highly secure implementation. So it's not just one check mark, two check mark. We have to look deeply into how those two are added together to see what kind of a security we are actually uh, getting. Now, it's important to note that we, we go through the NIST process to get certified modules but that's only half the story. While we do have a certified module, as I just pointed out, it's, it's due to the proper implementation of how we're going to manage the keys to use that certification module. And there's the difference between having a certificate of authority to do whatever you wanna do um, and putting them together. So a lot of vendors you'll wanna make complete note of that there are modules that have been done but have not been implemented. This is a very keen point to de uh, designate here. NIST oversees this, and it's interesting to note that it was mentioned several times in the last executive order. And to kind of look at, see how that uh, framework looks like, basically there are five key sections of that. First, of the identity of what it is, how to protect uh, ourselves against those identified threats, how to detect the threat if it does come to light, how to respond to that threat, and further and most important, how to recover from that threat. So those are the kinds of pieces as we put together our implementation of how we put the secure application together and how we move across. It's particularly important when we're dealing with audio, video, and USB, because these signals inherently weren't really created for that kind of use. But when we put them into the construct of this environment, it becomes crucial on how we do that. So it's important that we have pieces and parts that we can use, but it doesn't make the security just automatically appear. It's again, the implementation and how we securely implemented this and how did we address specifically the scalability when we start to traverse from enclave to enclave, environment to environment, skiff to skiff, those are all things that we need to consider moving forward. So as I mentioned before, we need some method of de uh, defining a level of security. This comes into the play where we have certain classified personnel, we have others that are in unclassified territory, we have others that are in secret territory. We'll pick on those three classifications to make our point here. The, the idea here is that there'll be a security um, piece that goes for not only one door, but other doors. In other words, there's a door for unsecured, there's another door for classified, and there's a door for secret. So we need multiple doors. We also need to keep in mind that in some intelligence communities and other DOD enclaves, the need for for placing air gaps to divide these doors even further is also implemented. So we have to keep that in the back of our minds as well. So the idea here is that we can't just simply connect media signals together. We need to do so smartly. We need to be able to make those signals and make sure that we've divided them up properly. So to help you kind of see this, what we're seeing here is that we'll use that top yellow banner as say our top se our secret rather, We'll use the red uh, uh, icons there to designate classified, and we'll use the black uh, icons on the bottom there 
to uh, uh, to kind of show you the unclassified. So we've got three levels of security here, but that's not as simple as saying, okay, well, the devices fall into those categories, but also the users fall into those categories. Further to that, we have groups of users and groups of devices that we need to think about. The other thing is that we have certain enclaves that are only restricted to the, these, uh, these classifications. We might mix them, that might be policy on how we uh, cross domain or use the cross domains. Um, that requires separate certification. But uh, the idea is that we, we can confine the signals to certain areas. So we have a lot of play here um, in terms of what to keep track of, users, devices, and asset signals, groups, and areas. Now, um, the physical security versus cybersecurity. This has been used in the past, physical security, that is. We haven't really been keen to cybersecurity because it wasn't as big a threat. It is a huge threat now. And so we still have to keep in mind physical security, but we also have to be mindful of how it can be done. So if you look very carefully at past certifications by other vendors, it's very keen to note the security target in their uh, EAL or other listings, whether it be um, uh, EAL or protection profiles, those are all things to keep track of in terms of the security levels and the security targets. We want to be able to address trusted users, but we really never really trust them. Um, we, we want to always have our guard up. Um, that's the idea behind zero uh, trust in that we might authenticate a user, but we're going to constantly be looking for any security um, out of bounds uh, requests, uh, things to keep track of for certain things inside the SCIF, outside the SCIF, or what have you. But we want to be very careful about what we've authorized and what we haven't authorized, and we always keep our guard up. That is really kind of the quintessential spirit behind zero trust. Now, um, we have the authentication piece where we can incorporate multi-factor authentication. This might be uh, as simple as a password, a very long password, mind you, might have in, in addition to that some uh, security with another device, for example. This could be, uh, this is shown in the consumer side of things with a smartphone. Obviously, that wouldn't be apropos for a Department of Defense piece, but we might have another security device that might be an encrypted key, a USB key that may be required for that user to go hand in hand with that. The idea here is that we not only have one authentication for the user, we have multiple authentications for the user. Now, in contrast to that, we have devices to manage, right? So these devices aren't people, they're things. And as such, they can be assigned uh, certificates of authority and have keys to unlock and lock. But the idea here is that each object would have a certificate of authority trust such that the, uh, the object has to connect to the controller. It has to have a, 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 a trust. Um, that certificate and the other certificate on both ends is referred to as mutual authentication. That's going to be keen as we move forward, not only with our security levels, but on the device level, we are going to have to make sure that all of the devices authenticate mutually so that we don't have any out-of-bounds requests so that... Um, bad guys can't get into the system and commandeer signals. We want to make sure that at least these rules are in place and enforced. To go along with that, it's very important to know that you've got some requirements for a VDS uh, in specific, a video distribution system, and if it's on IP, we have to be very keen to the essence flows. That means that any IP exposed into the area of operation has to be on a FIPS module. We need to incorporate the key insert uh, pieces and how we manage those pieces, how we can use the uh, agency's keys and certs or the um, Department of Defense enclaves keys and certs or other people's keys and certs. Those are all very keen to being able to uh, make sure we lock down all the devices as per the rules that go into the uh, in, in, in secure environments. We also have to keep in mind that some signals are not the same. In other words, they're not all equal. They have to be divided up into security levels. Some, um, some signals are obviously classified, others are not. Certificates based on the environments. Now, these are, this is kind of the wild card. Depending on the agency, they may require extra certificates. 
that meet their needs and goals uh, to achieve the kind of cybersecurity that they're after. And these are all pieces and parts that, uh, that play into each individual agency as, uh, as they're implemented. Now, again, looking back at uh, what we're talking about here, the thing I kind of uh, uh, focused in on was not only zero uh, trust architecture, but the secure cloud services. These are really keen to how we're going to architect a controller of some measure. And so this was brought up into the executive order, right? So, so specifically speaking, we want to be very careful because these are um, coming up real quick and we want to make sure that we uh, comply to the, the spirit of this address and uh, are looking at how we're going to architect this kind of solution with respect to uh, the uh, cloud solution. So the first thing that, that, uh, that, that should be considered is the data center foundation. In other words, um, how are our modern secure data centers doing this? Well, they're doing this using uh, uh, open source code for uh, Kubernetes and the container services, Docker containers to be specific. And as we implement these into the cloud structure, we can really lock down how these are, are, are secured. Uh, this is done much easier than to have uh, rogue uh, servers hanging out, uh, not that they can't be deployed on on-premises servers, but the point is, what is the platform for modern data center foundations? And we find that in Kubernetes and a number of other uh, areas, and we'll get into that in just a second here. But the idea here is that we should be looking for, as a designer, FIPS encryption from source to glass. Can we take that sensitive signal, move it, transport it, present it to the right place at the right time, and display it in front of officers and agents that need to see this interactively? So the container services seem to be the most logical way to do that. And if you look at current DOD initiatives, you'll find DevSecOps, you'll find uh, JADC2, you'll find uh, ABMS, you'll find a whole bunch of initiatives that are after better security, and they're all rotated around the idea of, of, of data center architecture, specifically Kubernetes and Docker containers. Here, uh, we have a number of platforms that we could actually initiate if we adopted those kinds of, of architectures. In other words, if we used a Kubernetes, we could put those onto oper uh, on-premises servers. We could also put those on secure government clouds. We could also put those on private data centers or any combination that we come up with or whatever the agency is insisting on. This is very transportable in terms of placement for the controlling part of this. Now, it's important to note that uh, a system should be divided into two basic planes. And this is, these are architecture planes that have been around for a long time. We have a control plane, which is where we're speaking to with respect to what has permission to move. And then we have the data plane to actually connect the video to video, audio to audio, USB to USB. So if we have a, a video source that's encrypted via IP and I send it to a box that's un, un, unencrypted, that flow from transmit to receive would be on the data plane. That holds true for audio, that holds true for video and USB. Now to control that, that's different, right? We're not actually transporting the, uh, the flow of those sensitive signals through the, through the cloud, rather controlled by the, the cloud type structure. So a Kubernetes control has access to all the devices, but the flows happen locally in SCIF. So that, again, uh, this gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of how we're going to, to go about this. We can actually choose on-premises servers. We can actually choose government cloud services. There might even be a data center that's inside the facility that get, could be parked at and is secure. As far as the initiatives go, um, we're looking very closely at what the government's suggesting that we build our applications with. And if you look closely, they're insisting on open source uh, uh, code, code that they can manipulate, code that they'll be able to use as they uh, see it as suiting to themselves, right? So we elected to architect our, our uh, uh, environments or other people have, have elected to do the same sort of thing on top of Docker containers, for example and Kubernetes and Rust and uh, database structures like Cassandra. 
Now, it's important to know that there are a lot of rules around the Docker container, and one uh, such uh, 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 derivative is from the Department of Defense's uh, container platform uh, security requirements sheet. Uh, this was originally drafted in uh, 2019, and um, it got an update late last year. We expect another update even still, but these are for effect uh, uh, STIGs, and we're, we're very keen to making sure that we're making uh, the container architecture meet these guidelines. And so it's very important that um, we, we pay attention to how it is that the government is looking at how to use these kinds of containers as they use their own and use others uh, as third parties. So the, 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 this is uh, one of the things to consider uh, moving into it. So the next transition uh, within the next 180 days, what does that mean for us? Well, so we're very keen to these, uh, these mandates and uh, we're, we're working aggressively to, to bring this to market. But what it doesn't mean is we can't use the rules of the past. In other words, if we insist on using baseband signals, then we can't use doorknob certs. Uh, doorknob certs don't have much of a security target. And in fact, if you look closely at some of those past uh, certs, you'll find that um, they don't require a heck of a lot other than describing that you can ac have access to any signal at any time provided that you have all 100% trusted users in your space. Well, um, seems kind of a little antiquated. Um, so you'll see a lot of mentions in terms of the specifics around these. And that's why we were so keen to um, pay attention to the mandates as they re re revolve around the NIST certs and, and all the five keys to make that all happen. So um, what does that mean for the VDS? Well, it means that we're going to have to start uh, doing this from the foundation. There's no shortcuts to good security. Um, and we have to plan for constantly change of the encryption standards, the key standards, the NIST standards. All of these will be constant moving targets. That's the whole nature of what our problem is. So it's important to be agile enough to move. And so is that possible? Of course it is. Um, we can future-proof that thing because... We can look at what it is we need to change that we know is going to change and architect that into our base platform. What do I mean by that? Well, we, need, we know that uh, quantum computing is coming around the corner. We know that this will probably be reality in the next 10 years. It could be reality next year. We don't know. But we know it's going to happen at some point. So how do we f future proof ourselves for that? We're starting to look at being able to change the crypto modules at a moment's notice. For example, the NSA has their own crypto module, and it's important for us to be able to let them use and others use their crypto modules. So the system should be architected in such a fashion where crypto modules can be changed out and moved. We know that new devices will come into play, authored by third parties. We need to be keen to how that's done and how those devices can take advantage of these crypto modules and how we would architect being able to change keys and so forth according to the guidelines of the agency using these systems. And we need a method to do that with. Um, so these are all kinds of pieces and parts of that. So the idea would be that we would have a modular approach to being able to take out and put in when needed. Uh, these changes happen nearly overnight, and we need to be able to respond to the speed of mission so that if we need to change these, we need to be able to offer the ability to do that at a moment's notice. Now, the whole idea here is that we don't stay put in glue. Uh, we can't become dinosaurs and, and, and put up with just okay, well, this is as secure as we're going to be able to get. No, we know these are always moving targets, as I just mentioned. For example, I'm already starting to pay attention to that TLS 1.2 is quickly uh, going to be moving to 1.3, and uh, we're already seeing the move of uh, cleanup uh, behind us, uh, where 1.1 and 1.0 extensions are being forced over to 1.2, because why? 1.2 is going to get moved over to 1.3. The same thing is happening all across the board. The secure hash algorithms, the SHA, uh, uh, have been moved up in numbers. AES-256 is going to be moved, probably. Uh, FIPS-140-2 is moving to 140-3. There will be more requirements around that, as we know. But the ability uh, and, and, and the, the uh, piece of the, about this is that change is constant. 
we know that this is a part of the system and we need to be able to address and change as this becomes more and more and more uh, secure. So um, we can do that in these kinds of uh, uh, atmospheres. In other words, the cloud offers us, the data centers office, uh, offer us with Kubernetes for um, control, um, Docker containers and secure uh, communications between those containers. Um, these aren't open to the public. These are hidden away. These are all offered up only to uh, the personnel that needs to get access. Uh, it's going to really lock these things down. That's why there's such a movement toward cloud. And the idea is pretty simple. We need to be able to take agencies that were once uh, kind of silos uh, unto themselves, and we may be able to share uh, information quickly from the battlefield to the airspace, to the water space, to the uh, space space. <laughs> All of these agencies are looking for ways of being able to communicate at the speed of their missions. And the, it's very important to give the warfighters the kind of tools they need and the speed they need to get access to the kind of, of and video plays into that, audio plays into that, USB control plays into that, especially in the control environments like uh, a C2 environment. These are all kinds of initiatives that we've, we've obviously enjoyed in the past, and we've used our equipment as PESA at, into these environments. But as we go forward to the next transition, it's very important that the game has changed. And the cybersecurity executive order is just one of several that have been uh, emitted from the U.S. government in terms of locking down uh, the kinds of use, not only for video and audio, but data. Um, these are all important. But when we move the video into the IP domain, we're going to be facing the same thing. Now, what we can enjoy of that is the speed of moving this information across networks that are secure. That's the upside of this. So that's um, really the, uh, the, the topic for my uh, presentation today. I'll be happy to take on any questions that you may have with respect to the material I've presented here and uh, welcome any other questions you have regarding um, what it is y that I have presented. Okay, great. Thank you, Dennis and Scott, for that comprehensive and informative presentation. As Scott mentioned, it is now time for our Q&A. So just as a reminder to our audience that if you want to ask a question, you can do that using the Ask a Question button. Um, we have one question in already. It says, I have a current baseband VDS. What are the first things I should do to bring it up to date? Well, um, this is kind of that area where we think, uh, others think the same, that, that uh, the baseband signals may not be suitable um, for use in, in C2 environments. So it's important to kind of take a peek and, and look what's out there. Um, we're not suggesting a forklift upgrade, but at least uh, the DOD mandates all communications to and from devices that have IP control, and most of them do. But it, the first uh, thing to take a peek at is whether or not those devices are even able to uh, speak FIPS so that all the communication within the SCIF is, uh, is up to speed and, uh, and, and uh, abiding by the mandate of FIPS 140-2 encryption for all IP traffic. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question from Mark Duke. He says, I understand the urgency of the executive order, but what committee, program, or mechanism will be put into place to verify and validate that the given agencies are performing to a high standard? That's a great question. Um, we don't know yet. Um, we know that there are certain certificates that are being are going to be asked of that. Certainly, the Doden APL process would be at, at least a, a, a no-brainer. Uh, but there are others that will need to be uh, looked at and, and uh, verified, et cetera, before an ATO can be given the authority to operate uh, a system that's new like this. So they, it, the verdict is kind of uh, not yet given uh, on this. Uh, there are certs that uh, haven't even been thought of, but. Uh, I would think that uh, there, there are certain categories uh, that have to be, uh, you know, used so that these could be verified. And certainly, Doden APL that makes the most sense to me. But if you look closely at, uh, at what you what you get into when you start to look at just the base Doden APL piece, 
is that they require FIPS. So it seems logical to me that you would need to re, uh, to at least to maintain all of the pieces and parts as foundational pieces, such as FIPS, and then move on to making sure that the signals are in fact locked down. And those certifications, frankly, I haven't seen a lot of that, but uh, they, they certainly need to be um, addressed by uh, each individual enclave as they see fit for their environments. Okay, good. Does PESA have best practices advice about implementing VDS in a data center? And are there any current cloud services providers with whom PESA partners? Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, the DOD uh, authors not only the container uh, pieces, but there are guidelines across the whole entire data center. And these are the pieces and parts that are going through um, development of their own uh, underneath the guise of Kessel Run and other uh, developers that are specifically writing code for the government, for government use. But with respect to VDS, um, th this is kind of a, a little niche area where we need to get video access to and from. And there are uh, a currently uh, no standing um, uh, certifications that are kind of at least easy to identify. There are KVM pieces parts um, but we intend to bring in partners like Arista and Cisco because they're a very uh, integral part of the IP backbone of the U.S. government and other uh, agencies. Uh, so these, these players are also mandated to do certain things with switch networks and so forth. And we're very keen to that. So um, most of the time, we're not participating in military networks, but rather once the signal has been uh, permitted to be used in a particular environment, it's our job to... See, uh, see fit that the signal gets transported from point A to point B uh, without uh, any possible tampering with. Um, so this is easier to, to, to accomplish in a cybersecurity sense um, with IP than it is, say, for example, baseband. Uh, so I know that's kind of a roundabout way of, uh, of looking at that, but um, that, that's Okay, what yeah, that's good. Mind. Um, does a system need to have mutual authentication and multi-factor? We think so. Um, we see several documents um, that are highlighted not only in the container um, um, mandate or guidelines, I should say, um, but there are others, right? We just think it's the solid way to do security. Um, that way we know um, we can check the cert, um, we can check uh, and issue private keys uh, and, and, and hold them in trusted protection modules, uh, all those sorts of things. And we, we know full well that uh, the SCIF has their own set of keys, their own set of certs, and we need to be able to have the ability to insert those uh, as they wish. In other words, provision uh, our physical hardware to meet their um, mutual authentication pieces so that uh, the, the node is talking to the Kubernetes cluster and we can trust that piece. Um, there's other pieces that go along with it. That's just one a string, but we would think that for sure uh, T TFA is already required. Two-factor authenticated uh, pieces are already required, uh, but we know that that that's, can't be just two-factor. It's got to be multiple-factor. We, we've got to look at the security of the physicality of that you know, cable. We also have to look at the uh, physicality of the environment that we're placing them in. Um, for example, encrypted keys might be used. There's all sorts of uh, tool in our toolkit that we can go about them, but mutual authentication seems to be a very logical first step um, in making sure that objects uh, uh, not only uh, trust each other, uh, but they're trusted within the system in, in totality. And that does include uh, the switch network, so that the, the, key, the, the, the switches that are involved in our kind of clustered area that we're going to connect video with, that we have accounted for all of that. Okay, good. Uh, someone is asking, can my current vendor add security to our system? That's a great question. I'll, I'll leave you with a little story. Um, my lead developer used to work for Apple, the Apple Fed Group, and uh, they were tasked with uh, creating a training app for the uh, a DOD enclave. And um, the developers did some excellent work, um, presented it to the security team, and said, here, we want you to go ahead and sprinkle the security dust on this, and off we go. They can, they can do their bit with this new app. And the security team looked at it and said, uh, well, boys, you're going to have to start again. Um, the, the, the idea of being able to sprinkle security dust at the end of your application 
doesn't work. You have to have it built in from the very beginning. I'll help you with the guidelines of what you need to do. But the idea is that there are no shortcuts to building a secure application. Um, it has to be started from the absolute core of this. And so um, with that, I will say that uh, you can't take uh, an existing uh, piece that was architected in an open fashion, so to speak, and then sprinkle security dust onto it to expect it to, to achieve this level, this cybersecurity level of security. It has to have deep within the system. And that's where we approach this as PESA. And PESA it did this with all the nodes, the controller, and everything that traversed, including the network switches. Okay, good. Uh, what can someone do today to meet the new requirements? Well, I'd start to get familiar with um, the current uh, NIST uh, factors. Uh, NIST seems to be the most uh, accurate in terms of what's going on in cybersecurity. It's why they've been tasked and why they were mentioned so many times. Um, this agency kind of gives us the, the security and algorithms uh, that have been tested in their labs and uh, have gone through a, a very uh, intense um, testing period, which is what we did with uh, one of our crypto modules. Um, so I would, to get familiar, to find out the lay of the land, uh, you'll have to be familiar with some of this encryption and how it's to be used, how it's to be implemented, how does it address, um, you know, the levels of security for use of these type of media signals, such as video and audio. Um, these are all important aspects when you're looking at a VDS to consider, right, so that um, you're at least familiar with the lay of the land uh, in terms of cybersecurity because they tie right together, especially when we traverse video as IP. This didn't happen in the baseband side of things because why? You can't encrypt SDI. You can't encrypt HDMI. You can't encrypt uh, I, uh, any other kind of common uh, cabled uh, video signal. So we took the approach that, okay, well, that's not possible. We'll need a device to do that for us. We were well cognizant that the, that the HDMI signals, the display port signals, the USB-C signals for video will never probably go away. In fact, they're evolving as we speak. And that will be used in the consumer year uh, for, for many years. But now can we take that signal and protect it and then transport it? That's the question. And so um, it seems logical that you should take these um, these signals and be able to convert them and encrypt them and then move them and then connect them uh, in accordance to the security level that they've been authorized to be viewed and seen and heard. So it's really more of an overall piece to get familiar with. That would be my best advice. Um, there are several initiatives out there that pertain to IP data, uh, but when we start to move these uh, media signals to IP, then, then all those rules are squarely in place. Okay, great. Uh, you had mentioned self-signed certifications. Could you go into that a little bit further and explain? Yeah, what you I'm glad that was brought up. Um, self-signed certs are, are, are a nuisance. Uh, they've been a nuisance for a long, long, long time. They were allowed from way back when, and that trick has been used a, 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 lo a, a lot of times. Um, in fact, if you look at some of the more recent breaches, you'll find these uh, that a self-signed cert was involved. <laughs> for one of better description. So it's important that as we uh, move into this environment that we use proper certs, we don't self-sign them. Um, anybody can self-sign the cert, um, but whether the device will accept that self-signed cert, there's where our problem is, right? So we have to get up to speed such that the device and the, uh, the method of authentication and the, and the method of mutual uh, trust between the two um, has to start with a bona fide uh, government-listed cert. Currently, there's only three agents or three um, um, companies that are uh, trusted by the federal government to be used uh, for enclaves, etc. So we paid attention to those, and uh, I would uh, he heavily look into how that's done. But a self-signed cert is just a recipe for disaster, and uh, it's important that a system, any system that's architected, would instantly uh, spot the self-signed cert notify anybody who's trying to put it in and then um, take action and get rid of it. Uh, these are how breaches uh, are rooted in too. 
Not that it's the exact cause or the end-all be-all to everything. It's not. It's just usually included in, in these breaches. Okay, fascinating. Um, how are modules more adaptable with respect to crypto? That's a great question. Um, so the idea that uh, the video environment has several companies uh, throughout its eco uh, sphere. Uh, so in other words, we have our version of things and other people have their version of things. Can we use this common crypto to take it and move the video uh, irrespective of the company brand? So can I take a brand X and a brand Y and could I put a crypto module? Yes, we can. And I think that's what we're exploring with partners to bring best of breed solutions to the table. Uh, so that um, you may uh, prefer a certain kind of brand for a certain kind of uh, of object, be it a camera or a whatever. Can we take and put crypto modules in those objects so that we can communicate with them um, in an effective manner and in a, in, a, in a manner that the DOD is insisting on? Can we do that? And the answer is yes. Good. Uh, one of our viewers is asking... Uh, my system is baseband. Why does it need to be cyber secure? And does this executive order apply to me? It technically doesn't, but it technically does. Um, the point that I started with is that uh, a baseband type of uh, signal can't be encrypted. So now what? Well, we took the approach of, well, let's, let's start to work with the new technologies, right? Now, that doesn't mean you have to throw everything out in the bathwater, but it, it should be, be being keenly aware that this video is pretty common. You can take out the, the connection to the monitor and place it into a recorder. That's how sensitive this is. Um, we don't necessarily see that as the, the way to do this, but uh, maybe other people do. We just don't see a bona fide way to meet the cybersecurity initiatives if the signals are still in the baseband environment. Uh, they're simply never built for uh, security. Okay. Uh, can someone just add some secure endpoints to a current system? Um, not really. Um, they have to be architected in the solution, and when you start to do that, you start to open up holes. So it's important to look for an end-to-end -end solution so that uh, no holes are presented. Um, or as much as they can possibly be, be buttoned up. That's the spirit of the initiative and the spirit of how this would work, right? So that um, each encrypted uh, object needs to communicate with that FIPS module we were just speaking to and, uh, and make sure that uh, we don't leave any uh, uh, gaps such that there's an open protocol, some open IP that anybody could intercept and, and figure out really quickly what we're doing. And that's, uh, that's kind of anti what we're trying to do. Um, but um, so the notion of just simply putting in an, an encrypted piece is only one part of the equation. You have to look through the rest of the system to make sure that you haven't uh, left a, a security hole open. And, and therein lies all of the, the muscle behind uh, the, the system, right? We want to make sure that all those holes are covered. Okay, good. I think this may be our last question. You had mentioned quantum computing. What was the significance? significance there? Yeah, quantum computing um, it has the ability to decrypt things very quickly. Um, that's, the, that's the threat. So can we create methods whereby we render that guy um, pretty, pretty hard? Well, we can do that by locking out the environments that we're in. So it kind of goes anti um, the idea of a wide area network. We're going into local area networks and, and in enclaves where we have certain uh, holes through that. So we're, we want to be very keen to the way that the uh, security guidelines as they pertain to quantum computing are. We know that if we rotate types of encryption along with rotating of keys, that's what banks are looking at. Um, they're going to be the, be the most sensitive to this at this juncture. So they've already had initiated their own uh, kind of uh, pieces and parts against people stealing money, uh, which is a, a big importance if you're a bank. And uh, the quantum computing uh, uh, pieces and parts, there's lots of it, but the idea is it's a supercomputer, super and it has the ability to do uh, the, uh, very quick work of unraveling uh, big, big algorithms. So um, this is a threat, and we need to be very careful about how we're going to architect future solutions. All right, excellent. 
Dennis and Scott, thank you again, and thank you to Thanks our so much, viewers. George. And yeah, and, and thank you to our viewers for submitting questions. If you submitted a question that did not get answered, our experts will try to follow up with you directly offline. Please note that there are some resources available to you, uh, including the uh, slides used in the presentation uh, under the Resources tab. And you can also link to an archived version of this webinar and see previous Signal webinars on AFSEA's Signal Magazine website. That concludes our Signal Media webinar for today. Again, we thank all of you for being with us. Have a great day, everybody.